I think the important thing for founders to know is just that the way that late stage financing is dried up is very real. I'll give you like two data points just this week. So I got my first notification from a portfolio company. This is a company I invested in before Kraft. It's not a Kraft investment, but my personal investments. And they're doing a pay to play round. You know what that is? Explain what that is. That means pain. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the way it works is they say they're going to raise $20 million. Well, by the way, they said they went out to raise growth funding, weren't able to get a term sheet from anybody. And no takers. No takers. And this is a a good product. I mean, a lot of startups use this product. I think their ARR is in the 20 something million, maybe 30 something million. Mm -hmm. It's not like doubling year over year, it's growing like, let's call it 50% year over year. This is a company that should have been able to raise money. I don't understand why they weren't. Maybe because they're burning too much money. So instead of cutting costs the way they should, they're doing like a $20 million pay to play round. And what that means is that everybody who's an investor in the company, you either have to do your prorated share of the 20 million or you get diluted 10 to one. If you had 10% of the company, you have to put in $2 million or your 10% of the company is now 1%. No, it'd be be more because you would look at let's say 50% of the company is owned by the investors and the other 50% is common, just to take round numbers. Sure. Okay. If you own 10% of the company, that would actually be 20% of the preferred. Yes. Yeah. The employees are not buying shares in this. 20% of the, of the, of the so 20 4 million. million. So it's 4 million. 4 million. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So basically you have to pay- own 1%. <laughs> right. Right. So basically it's almost like a capital call where <sighs> you just have to pony up more money in order to preserve your ownership in the company. Punitive, and, by the way, if it makes yeah, you feel it is better, punitive, but yeah. super punitive. I had one of those just happen to me as well. And I was just like, we'll put in the bare minimum because like the thing that it puts you in, it paints you in a corner where you're like, well, I've been with this thing for eight or nine years. Is this the moment to basically lose all of that compounding or value or work that you have put in or seen their team do? And it's just a really tough position, right? Yeah. So look, I'm not on the board, so I don't know what reasoning went into this, but what they should be sending out to all the shareholders is, look, here are all of our metrics. Here's our burn. You know, here's the steps we took to reduce our burn. I don't really like the idea of having to do essentially a capital call from your existing investors when you haven't reduced your own burn. I mean, why can't the company operate at break even if you're at 30 something million of ARR, you should be able to operate. Uh, you may not want to operate at break even, but you, but this you should is, be able to. But Sax, this is what I mean. I'll tell you after we stop taping who it was that that told me this about their company. But they were basically able to let go a third of their workforce by moving a bunch of work to models. And let me guess, the founders get to keep their shares or they get re-upped in this whole mishugana? No, no, no. But wait, hold on. Can we? Can I just finish this yeah, point? Yeah, please, so please. Like, of course. Sorry. So, to so, so the point is like if you can cut OPEX by a third by using all of these new AI you know, models and GPTs and auto GPTs, what are you as a board member or shareholder supposed to do? And also, as a founder, don't you have to go there first before you start to ask people for more money? And why aren't people doing that first much more aggressively? And so this is what doesn't make any sense to me. That's exactly my point is what steps were taken to cut costs before you just went to the investors to pony up more money? That's what I want to know. If they actually did that work and this is like the last money they need, okay, then, you know, I'll pony up my share. And by the way, we need investors to be, no, we don't. And we need investors to be much more aggressive in holding folks accountable because these examples need to be better discussed. Well, if XYZ company was able to do it, why aren't you able to do it? And if it's because we're not technically capable, nah, that's maybe a plausible answer, but even that reason will go away in a few months, I suspect. But if it's that we just have such institutional rot, we're incapable of doing it, well, then you might as well just not write the check because that company is going to get undercut by some new white sheet version of that business that doesn't have any of these impediments. That management just uses has told you a bunch of agents. Chamath, in a way, Chamath and Sachs, management has told you they're incapable of running this business, this concern in a, in, in a thoughtful way. I had this happen to us as well. And the, the, the question I have for you, Sachs, is in these situations where this pay to play happens, you basically, everybody gets wiped out except who, those who, who play. But the founders and the management team always seem to get re up and they're whole because the new investor doesn't want the management team not incentivized. So in these kind of situations, it's kind of like the management team gets to reboot the cap table and they don't get penalized. I don't know. I, I actually, I don't, I don't have those details yet. 
Yeah. I remember I didn't lead around. I was just an angel mm. investor in the company. So I checked with one of the VC firms that led around and I'm like, are you going to do this? And they said, probably not, you know? Mm. And so like the round might fail. I mean, they can make it as punitive as they want, but if the shareholders don't believe that the company has fixed its problems, they're not going to pony up the money. Let's get free bargain. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the problems that a lot of folks are facing is it becomes less about the fundamental value of a business in a lot of these conversations, as you guys know, and it's becoming a lot more about who will fund the next round if the company is still burning money. And so you're making a social market bet, not a bet on the team or the business or the value. It's that there's someone else that's going to lead the next round. And this is fundamentally why... He's half, called the greater fool. That's called well, the greater fool theory. It, look, I mean, it's historically, we wouldn't call him a fool if it's just about progress towards profitability. But right now, there's so much trepidation. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy that there's so much trepidation in doing late stage rounds that no one wants to be the last guy in because you're not sure if the next guy is going to be there to fund the last round to get to profitability. And that's why half of biotechs that are public are trading below cash. Because historically, the way biotech companies, which is a, a really good pointed example of this, they make progress to hit milestones. And then the next round of capital comes in, they make progress, hit milestones, next round of capital comes in. And then eventually you get, you know, phase three approvals, and you go sell the company or, or whatever, you get profitable, and they almost always get acquired. And in the case of other technology companies, if the business has to do three or four things, it's got three or four milestones it has to hit. In your case, Sachs, it might be that they got to get to 50 million ARR and they got to get, you know, the certain cost function down in the business. And if they can do those two things, then the business is profitable. But it's going to take us a round of 20 and we'll get the first chunk down and then another round of 30 to get the last chunk done. And no one knows if the next 30 is going to be there. And that's really where a lot of these market dynamics are falling apart, that there's historically been a model in the market of hit milestones, next round shows up, hit milestones, next round shows up. And now no one knows if the next round will show up. So no one wants to fund this round, particularly where there's high burn and it requires a lot of capital to make that bet. So the social, you know, the self-fulfilling problem of the social market bet right now is, you know, it, it self-fulfills and, and we're, um, you know, we're sitting here kind of... At, spinning our thumbs, wondering if the next guy's going to fund it. Do you think that only 10 or 15% of companies have now properly reset value? Like you said, 70% of these unicorns are actually zombie corns. Yeah, that's why I think the number from, I, I don't want to, I don't know Tiger's book at all. But when I hear numbers like 20% for a, for a fully invested mature book that invested during the, the peak of the cycle, it doesn't sound right that it's 20%. It sounds like it should be a lot lower. I like think the, that 20%, the, by the way, you know, comes after like two other smaller write downs. So they might be cumulatively. Yeah, so I don't want to talk 40, about Tiger. Yeah. I don't want to talk about Tiger. I think yeah, like yeah, sure. the statistic of 70% of these public companies trading below their cash, that the cash that they've burnt, that they've raised in their lifetime. And again, just to, for anyone that's an al analyst at home, try to figure out how we get to that number. You look at the um, retained earnings on the balance sheet. And so the cumulative retained earnings tells you if it's negative, tells you how much money they've burnt over their lifetime. And that tells you effectively how much money has been invested. So when you look at the enterprise value, which is the market cap minus the cash they have today, you get their enterprise value. If their enterprise value is less than their cumulative retained earnings, it means that they're currently worth less than the money they've spent. And that's a statistic that is a fact right now in public markets in technology gone public in the last three years. And then you compare that to private markets. And I don't think we've seen a 70% write down yet or, you know, 70% of these things being worth less than the cash. So it's, um, you know, it's still, yeah, I think you're right, Jamath, there's probably a, another hammer to drop. Multiple, Multiple hammers. Multiple <laughs> hammers. Before we move on to a different topic, so I think one of the interesting differences in opinion in, in Silicon Valley is the way that founders and VC see the nature of the relationship. And I've been on both sides of this. I've been on the side of being a founder, and I've been on the side of being a VC. And what you'll see is that VCs always talk about it as a partnership, but a lot of founders will talk about it as if the money is just a commodity. And frankly, when everything's up and to the right and everything's going great and you're in a bull market and you can just keep raising money and definitely because there's always someone willing to lead the next round, then the money is a commodity. But when you're in a, in a down market and all of a sudden there is no market, like you can't raise your next round, all of a sudden it is a partnership because you've got to go to your investors and ask them to do something that they may not otherwise want to do. 